for everybody to see real quick before I dive into the new stuff. Um, there was a problem in the homework. What was it? Number six? Yeah, 4.3, number 16. In fact, let me, um, let me go back and... Okay, yeah, so there it is. So 4.3, number 16. And the first two parts weren't, weren't, weren't bad, but then the third part, you had to graph the thing, remember? They gave you a window and everything like that. Um, you know, when you type into Y1, and it, we we're trying to type in this function, right? X divided by 7X squared plus 8. I don't know if you know, but if I type it in that way, that's not the right function. That, it won't work that way. Because whenever there's more than one item in a zone, meaning denominator, numerator, or power zone, you have to put parentheses around it. You have to put parentheses around that. Or the calculator will only put the first thing underneath. It doesn't know they're both in the denominator. Do you know what I mean? The calculator, if you don't, if you don't, if you just write it this way with no parentheses, the calculator thinks, whoops, doesn't think that, but it thinks that only the X is over it and the 8 is separate. That's what the calculator thinks. Well, I mean, at least if you have the old-fashioned kind like I do, where, you, where it's all on one line. I know the newer ones, like, make fractions for you, huh? If you have those kind, you're good. It's just no problem. It knows what's going on. But if you have the older kind that lays everything flat, like that, then you have to put, if, if you don't put parentheses, it only puts the very next thing in the denominator. It doesn't know the eight's also part of the denominator. So that's not just for denominators, that's for any time you have more than one item in a zone, right? Numerator zone, if more than one thing are all on the top, or more than one thing are together in the bottom, or more than one thing are together in the power world, then you have to put parentheses. That's what the parentheses really do, is they say, hey, this group hangs together. Right? You have to parenthesize. So if you put parentheses, then the calculator knows, oh, okay, the 8's down there, and then everything will work out for you on that. So watch out for that. Really, really easy mistake to make, and um, a lot of people make it over the years. All right, number 9. Number 9. Okay, so uh, 2x cubed greater than 18. Well, it's, I don't need to rewrite it. Um, let me go through the steps. Step one on these. So uh, these are greater than, less than questions. First off, you know, sometimes in math it's hard to recognize one thing from the other, right? It can all blend together. Let me give you the, the mark, greater than, less than. On the next exam we take, exam number two, any problem that's got greater than, less than, you want to think, okay, yeah, that's one of those where I've got to get a zero and I've got to eventually do the number line thing and that kind of stuff, these, these kinds. So step one is to get a zero. So I've got to take this 2x cubed greater than 18x squared and, and subtract the 18x squared from both sides. Get it like that. Get a zero and factor or make it one fraction. Well, this one doesn't even have fractions, so it's not going to apply in this case. But step one is all about getting a zero and then getting the thing into the right form. Let's you, into the right form. The right form means um, factor it. In our case, if it was fractions, make, make the two into one fraction. So get a zero and get it in right form. Okay, so how do I factor that thing? You know how to do that, right? Let me give you just a second. Go ahead and factor that thing. Okay, so how do we factor that thing? Factor out a 2x squared, right? 2 goes into 2 and 18. You take the lower power on the x's. One of them is x squared, so that's the lower power. What does that leave on the inside? Whatever works. 2x squared times what would be 2x cubed? x. And 2x squared times what would be 18x squared? Minus 9 greater than zero. Good so far? So it's all factored. Now we're ready to go. So step one is get a zero and factor, or if it's fractions, make it one fraction. Okay. Step two is find what makes it equal zero. Right? Can you just look at this thing with me and tell me what values of x 
are going to make that thing equal zero. What, what's going to make this, this part, this player, x to zero? You with me in there? If, x, if you plug in zero there, 2 times 0 squared will be 0 times whatever, times whatever's in that parentheses, doesn't matter, 0 times anything will be 0, right? And what makes this part 0? What can I plug in for x here that'll make this part 0? Positive 9. So 0 and 9 are the x values that, if plugged in, will make that thing equal 0. They won't make it greater than 0. I'm going to do the greater thing in a minute. Or at the end, huh? But for now, I just find out what makes it right on the money zero. Equal zero exactly. Zero and nine. Zero and nine. So now step three, number line. Go to the number line, and we're basically going to do a graph without doing the graph. Remember these things? Zero and nine. Put them on the number line. And basically, we're just trying to figure out uh, their, their original question to us. Well, maybe not the original, but the version after I got the zero says greater, doesn't it? Greater than zero. What does greater than zero mean? Where's the function above the axis? Above, right? Things that are, that's a V there. Greater than zero are above the x-axis, right? Positive. Numbers that are greater than zero are positive, right? And all, all of this is what y is, right? Oh, that's the function. We want to know what, where is the function, where is the graph greater than zero? So where is the function greater than zero? So, well, well, let's figure out the end behavior first off. How do we figure out the end behavior? Like, what's it doing at the end? Yeah, highest power, right? You guys with me? End behavior is always highest power. What's the highest power? Well, 2x cubed. Positive. So if the, all I care is if the highest power is positive, then that graph is going up to the right. If the highest power is negative, then that graph is going down to the right. Does that make sense? So this one's going up to the right. It's got to, because it's positive. Is that, is that good? I want to make sure that makes sense, because you'll remember it better, I think, if it really makes sense. Right, because if you think about the original fun or the, the function we have right here, 2x cubed minus 18x squared, that's our, that's our function, and we're wondering where is that thing greater than 0. You could call it y if you wanted to give it a name. That's our function. We're saying, wh what happens if you go way off to the right on the x-axis? I mean way off to the right. Like plug in 1,000 or plug in a million to this. Well, whatever happens, the, x, the 2x cubed is going to determine it because he's a higher power than the x squared, right? Okay, see what I mean? If I plug 1,000 in here, 1,000 cubed is so much bigger than 1,000 squared. Let alone a million cubed is way bigger than a million squared. So really, this guy, is the, the most powerful term, is going to determine the behavior at the end, right? See how we just grab the most powerful term? And whatever his sign is tells you up, positive, negative, down. He's positive, so it's going up. So the end behavior is up. Okay, now we just look at the 9 and the 0, and we decide if they're bouncers or passers through, right? Remember, how, how, how do we determine that? Is 9 a bouncer or a pass-through? Where, where do we find that? Yeah, the power on that term. Look, look back here at the, at the factored version. It's a first power on the term that led to the x equals plus 9 the x minus 9 term, which gave us the x equals positive 9 to make it 0. That's a first power. Remember, when that's odd, it passes through. It doesn't bounce. And how about at 0? Is 0 a bouncer or a passer through? It's a bouncer because look at the power on that term. It's a 2 power on that term the term that led us to the x equals 0 x-intercept, right? It's a 2, so that one's even. So what it means, it's going to come here, and it's going to go boing, and it's going to bounce back down. So that gives us a quick general feel of the picture, doesn't it? We don't know exactly, exactly, but we know what we need to know. Where are the things above and where are the things below, right? So what do they want from us now? Where's the answer? They want to know where is it above. So where is it above? 9 to infinity, huh? 
in this area. The graph is above. So our final answer then, 9, two, we don't have any, there's, there was not a bar in the beginning, like a greater than or equal or less than or equal, there was no equals bar. So if there's no bar, there's no brackets. Remember, BB goes together, bar leads to brackets, no bar, no brackets, right? There was, they never wanted the equal stuff. So we don't put any brackets, it's just parentheses 9 to infinity, not including the 9, because we're not equal to anything. 9 to infinity is the answer. What, what does that mean? That means all values from 9 to infinity, if you plug into this thing, it'll be true. That original inequality is true. For any number a little bigger than 9, like 9.1 or 9.01, not 9 right on the money, plug 9 right on the money, they're equal, not greater. But anything a little bigger than 9, all the way up to 10 zillion, zillion's not really a number, but you know what I mean, then it'll be true. This thing is true. Make sense? So when you see greater than, less than on the test, two in a couple weeks, you know right away, oh, yeah, got to do that whole get a zero go factor, go to the number line thing. That's, that's when you have to do that. You can put this on your three-by-five card, parts of it anyway. often have trouble on this section, not terribly, but kind of medium trouble on this section. So I'm hoping it goes a little better this time. You guys did very well in the first exam, better than typically, so... Maybe this will go well, too. So let's try this. Give that one a try. I've already got the zero for you. So just go ahead and do the factor thing, right? What's the first step in factoring that thing? Take out an x. So I could always do GCF first, huh, remember? From your algebra days, always take out what's in common first. And then how do we factor the x squared minus x minus 90? That's like the FOIL thing with the two parentheses, right? So let me let you do that. I know that's problematic a lot of times. Use your calculator. You, know, you don't have to memorize all those. Just... If you're not sure about that 90, use your calculator. All right, we're looking for the two parentheses. I, I write the word FOIL, or you could just write multiply, add. Same thing, right? You got to multiply to be, you need two numbers that multiply to be the 90. And add to be the number in the middle. What's the number in the middle? Negative 1, huh? Right, so you're looking for two numbers that multiply to be 90. What times what's 90? Take your calculator out if you're not sure. Get some different things. What multiplies oops, to be 90? Multiplies to be 90. Yeah, 9 and 10 is a great choice. 3 and 30, and probably other things. But 9 and 10 is our choice, huh? 9 and 10. X is in the front, I forgot. 9 and 10. Now, how do you know the sign? Really important that you get the signs wrong, everything's going to get messed up. That's, that's the kind of thing I see a lot of times. So let me, make, let me give you some help. There's, there's one sure, reliable rule for the signs. Remember, have I said it? Sign in the middle always goes to which one? The bigger. Sign in the middle goes to the bigger. Sign in the middle is negative. Therefore, the bigger, the 10, will be negative, and the other one's plus, right? Because 10, positive 10 minus, I'm sorry, positive 9 minus 10 will be negative 1 in the middle, won't it? And they'll multiply, positive times negative, to be negative 90, right? Is that good? So sign in the middle goes to the bigger. All right, now what is that? So that's step one, you know, get it factored, get a zero, get it factored. We got it. So keep going from there. Let me let you do the next step. Look back if you're not sure. Step two. So you gotta find what makes each of those equal zero, right? So each part that has an x has the potential to become zero. So that's step two. What makes it equal to zero? 
this guy, this guy, and this guy can all make the thing right on the money zero. I know we're solving less than zero. We'll get to that at the end. But for now, we want to know what makes it equal zero right on the money. So what makes this piece equal zero? Well, zero. What makes the x plus 9 equal zero? Negative 9. What makes the x minus 10 equal zero? Positive 10. So he's opposite sign, huh? Good on that. Which is 0, negative 9, and positive 10. And then put those on the number line. Right? Those are your three dots on the number line. And then do the end behavior thing and the bounce pass through thing and find out where the graph's above and where it's below and then see if you can answer the final question. Number line, or I could call it just graph. We're basically casually graphing, huh? So we have negative 9, 0, and positive 10. All right, we want to know in the end, what's the behavior in the end? So is it positive? So how do you, how do you determine the end behavior? Yeah, this term, right? Are you okay with, see how we kind of play this dance back and forth between the factored version and the multiplied out version, right? The multiplied out version here, before we factored it, with the highest power term, that is going to tell you about the end, huh? Because if you plug like a thousand or a million, you know, way off to the end, a thousand or a million, into the original function, all that's going to matter is the most powerful term. He will dwarf the other smaller ones, right? He'll dominate. So it's positive x cubed. It's positive. That means it's up, huh? If that was negative x cubed, then it, would be go then it would be below the axis. It would have to be. It'd have to be negative in the end. But it's positive x cubed, so it's going to eventually plug in a big enough number off to the right. It's going to be positive. Well, in fact, anything to the right of 10. It'll never be negative again after 10. How do I know that? How do I know that anything to the right of 10 is never going to come down below the axis and be negative again? Yeah, we found all the intercept points, huh? It can't go down again because there'd be another intercept point, right? And I know, I know in the very end it's positive, and I know it, it, it can't cross again after 10, so from 10 on it's positive, huh? It's got to be. See how this is pretty valuable. We have some, we have some fair bit of power now, don't we? See how the, these mathematical insights, you know, it's like flying the plane by the instruments. Those instruments tell you some pretty valuable things. With, that, with pretty easy work. You don't have to do a bunch of plugging in and a bunch of fooling around. Just by knowing a few things, you have quite a bit of knowledge about what these functions are doing now. All right. How about now let's do the, uh, the pass-through bouncer thing. So um, these are just all passers through, aren't they? They all pass through because they're all first power, first power, first power. They're all odd. Remember, odd powers pass through, right? You guys know what I'm talking about about that? Right? Uh, remember, because remember the graph of y equals x cubed? There's an odd power. Remember, he passes through when he has an intercept. As opposed to x squared, an even power does what when he hits the x-axis? Bounces. Right? Even powers bounce because they're the same sign when you square them. But odd powers pass through because the sign changes for odd, right? All right, so these are all passers through, pass through, pass through, pass through. Because none of them are even power. None of them are going to bounce. All right, so what do they want from me now? They want less than zero. What does less than zero mean? Below, negative. Numbers that are lower than zero are negative. They want to know where's the thing negative? Here and here. So that means between zero and 10 on the x-axis and negative infinity to negative nine, huh? Those two sections. So, um, so the answer then is negative infinity to negative 9, comma, what is it, 0 to 10. No, no brackets on anything because we didn't have a bar in the beginning. It was just less than 0. It wasn't less than or equal to. So it's just parentheses on everything. From negative infinity to negative 9 and from 0 to 10, the graph is below. The graph is less than 0. <coughs> Questions on that? That makes sense. We're kind of like graphing... Casually. Y'all good?
Question. Because I'm going back to the original question and it says less than zero. Yeah, so less than zero. Well, what numbers are less than zero? If I said, hey, I'm thinking of a number, it's less than zero. It's negative, huh? It's negative. Yeah, so back in the beginning, if they say they want less than zero, that's why we get a zero on the first step. Because we always have to see what are they what are they doing compared to zero. So if they want less than zero, then they want where the graph is below the axis, below the axis, instead of the zones where it's above where it's negative instead of where it's positive. Good? Good question. All right. This is the big algebra mess. All right. So let's give it a try here. Okay, good. All right. So, so step one, remember what it was. It's get a zero and factor or make it into one fraction. So here's what I was talking about. So first step, I'm just going to jump that 5 over, and we get 6x minus 2 over x plus 1 minus 5 less, or I just subtracted 5 from both sides, right? We good to there? I just subtract 5 from both sides. Now, I've got to take those two and put them together, make it one fraction. We can't have two separate. We gotta put them together because all of our logic about numerator and denominator and all that stuff, it's all it only works for one fraction. You can't have like two, so you can't have a fraction and then a five. You know, that, that just won't work. So how do we put those two together into one big fraction? What do we do? Put that over 1, make it look like a fraction, right? Whenever you've got a whole number in right with a fraction, put it over 1, make them look like they're both fractions. All right, so here, here we go. Let me, let me give you a second. Can you put those together? This is algebra, but, this is, but, but I don't say that lightly. This is the messy algebra, the hard stuff that really fights people in calculus. So let me help you with that. So go ahead, let me give you a second to get more out of them if I just do it. See what you remember from algebra. How do you combine you those? I do this all the time in calculus. You want to get really comfortable. Okay, what do I do? Top and bottom by x plus 1. Remember that kind of stuff? Because that'll make the two denominators the same, right? We've got to make the bottoms the same so we can put them together, right? You can only add, subtract fractions when the denominators match. All right, so what does that give me? 6x minus 2, and then that minus, now, here's the other mistake. Just put that minus right on the 5, and then distribute it. Minus 5x minus 5 all over x plus 1. And then, so, well, let me slow down. Is that okay? And then we're going to combine like terms on the top. But is that okay so far? Do you remember that kind of stuff from your algebra days? You want to practice that and get real comfortable with it because it's all over the place in calculus. 6x minus 5x, x, and minus 2 minus 5, it's minus 7, all over x plus 1. We made it into one fraction. We put the two together into one fraction. Is that good? <coughs> so that's all step one. So now we're ready to go on. Step two. <coughs> Step two now. Remember what, remember what we need to do when it comes to a fraction? I can't remember how much of this we've talked about. I get confused with my other section. What do we do when we got a fraction now as far as the zero thing? The numerator and the denominator. Have I said that? I can't remember. So we've got to do the numerator, find out what makes the numerator zero, because that will make the whole fraction zero. Um, so that would just be um, x minus 7, just the top there, right? Which just means x is 7, right? And then we've also got to do the denominator separately. We've got to do them separately, numerator and denominator. That would just be the x plus 1 equals 0, which you know is just negative 1. So we got our two answers. But one of those is actually going to be a vertical asymptote dotted line, huh? Which one? Yeah, the denominator one. Because that makes the denominator zero. So that's undefined. That's a vertical asymptote, huh? 
So when we go to my number line graph thing, I'm going to put the negative one, I'm going to put a vertical dotted line there, because that's my asymptote line, and the positive 7 is just a normal x-intercept dot, because that made the top 0, which just makes the fraction 0 when you make the top 0. But if you make the bottom 0, it's undefined, huh? Good with that difference? Yeah, so if you're ready, I'm going to go to a flash to a new screen and put those on the number line. Okay, so go to the number line now. This is step three. Number line. And what was it? Ne negative seven, zero? No, negative seven, one? No, positive seven, negative one. And there we are. Everybody got that copy down okay? Positive seven, negative. So put, go ahead and I'll let you, I'll leave it up for a second. Put those on your number line on the next sheet. I'll do it. Put those on the number line and then... Uh, make sure you put the dotted vertical asymptote line for negative 1. And then go ahead and do the in-behavior stuff. Pass through, bounce, you know, where you can. You can't do it for the vertical, but you can do it for the 7. Right? So we're going to have the 7 and the negative 1, right? 7 and negative 1, yeah. So like that, 7 and negative 1, right, on the number line. So go ahead now and do the pass through, bounce thing. Go over here. Oh, I'm sorry, the in-behavior. Yeah, first do the end behavior, huh? So go over here, do the end behavior. Find out what the thing's doing at the end. Is it positive or is it negative after that 7, you know? So to, to figure that out, look, look at the what's the power. Oh, oh by the way, the, yeah, I should mention this, guys and gals. Once, once we get... Um, the zero and the factor or one fraction, that's, we just, we never go back again. We just pretend that was the original problem. It's just easier to work with that. So I'm just going to work with this from this point forward. Whenever I plug things in or mess with anything, I'm just going to go to that one. That's the same as the original question, right? All I did was move the five over and combine them into one fraction. To answer this is to answer the original question. It's equivalent to the original question. So, Ben, this is easier to deal with. So let's just deal. Once you get the zero, just work with that one. So we're going to just work with this. Let me put that on the other screen. X minus 7 over X plus 1. So it's X minus 7 over X plus 1 less than or equal to zero, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's the one we're working with. And so, um, therefore, when I ask what's the end behavior, can you tell me, guys, if I plug in like a 1,000 or a million, you know, way over at the end, way over to the right, Plug a thousand in here and a thousand in here. What are you going to get? My, my, I, I, well, you're just going to get x over x. I don't, I don't care about the number. I mean, all that's going to matter is the most powerful term on the top and the most powerful term on the bottom. When you're plugging in very large numbers, the smaller ones don't matter. The seven and the one don't matter. And x over x is just one, which actually means it's a horizontal asymptote. Remember how we learned that earlier? But, but right now, I don't care about all that. I just want to know above or below, positive or negative. Positive. Positive 1. So it's up here. It's leveling off at a height of 1, but I really don't care about all that. I'm not being asked what the horizontal asymptote is. That is what that means. Now, you guys know that quite well, right? That, you know, x over x is positive 1. That means a flat. It's going to eventually flatten out at a height of 1, isn't it? But who cares? I'm not interested right now in that. I just want to know, is it above or is it below? It's above. It's positive. It's positive. Now, if that had been, I know you might think, well, how would that not happen? What if that had been 7 minus x over x plus 1? Then most powerful top and bottom would have been negative x over x would have been negative 1. It would have been below. See how that could happen? So we got positive. All we care about is the sign of the most powerful term on the top and bottom. The sign comes out to be positive over positive, positive. So it's, okay, now it's 7, so it's, it's above, it's positive. Now, is it going to bounce or pass through at the 7? Yeah, both the 7 and the 1 are just first power. Remember, it's the power that's on them. So it's just going to pass through because it's an odd power. It's going to pass through. Now, good so far? You guys with me? Now we're coming to the vertical asymptote. I can't do the pass-through bounce thing for the vertical asymptote, right? I can't put a P or a B because it's going to do neither. It's going to do neither, right? You don't pass through a vertical asymptote because you can't touch it, and you don't bounce at a vertical asymptote because you can't touch it. 
You don't touch a vertical asymptote. You don't pass through, and you don't balance. You skip it, don't you? So we can't do that for vertical asymptotes. That's only for normal x-intercepts. Well, what can we do? Well, it's either going to go down, kind of looks like it might, but maybe not. Maybe it'll go up. How do we know? We know. There's not another x-intercept. It can't go through another spot like that. See how valuable our knowledge is? It's got to take a dive on the right side of that vertical asymptote. It has to because it can't go up, right? We know, we know it passed. It was up above, and it passed through the 7, and it, there's no other x-intercept, or we would have found it between negative 1 and 7. It cannot go back up through the x-axis again. So what other choice does it have? It's taken a dive. It's got to. See how valuable how powerful this information is? All right, now, what about the other side of negative 1? Is it up here or down here? We don't know. We're going to have to plug in. That's the one time we're going to just have to plug in. Because it could be up here, it could be down there, it could do either one. There's no real good way to know. Because we, don't, we couldn't do the pass-through bounce thing. With a vertical asymptote, you often need to end up plugging something in. Because you can't do the pass-through bounce. Because it skips vertical asymptotes, right? So how do you know? Well, you just plug something in. Um, so let's do that. What are we going to plug in? Yeah, just some number in this zone. Like, yeah, like negative 2 or negative 3 or negative 10 million. Anything. So plug into what, though? Plug into what? Go back to the beginning? No, 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 no. Remember which version we work with? This one. Why? Why that one? Because we're compared to 0 now. We're all about are you above 0 or below 0. Not 5. And, and, and it'll be, the answer to this will be the same answer. But we want to know relative to 0. Compared to zero, right? So let's take the x minus 7. Well, here, it's already written down. Let me just take the negative 2 and put it in, put it in, and see what I get right there. What I get is, what, negative 2 minus 7, negative 2 plus 1, so negative 9 over negative 1. What's that? 9? It came out positive, huh? Positive 9, is that below zero? No, it, it's, it's up here. It's up. It came out positive, didn't it? When I put in negative 2, top and bottom, I end up getting negative over negative. I ended up getting positive. It's up here. It's positive. So that means the graph is up here somehow. Y'all with me? Does that make sense? Okay, so it's up there. All right, we're ready to answer the final question now. What? What is the question? Where is the graph? Remember, you don't, you don't go back to the beginning. You go to this one. This is equivalent to the beginning. Where is the graph less than zero, which means what? Above or below? Less than zero? Below. Where is the graph below? Here. That's the only section, huh? From negative 1 to 7. From negative 1 to 7. Do we put any brackets? Oh, yeah, we do. We have a bar in the beginning here. Right, it was less than or equal to, wasn't it? So we would like to put a bracket instead of a parenthesis. But can I put brackets on both of them? Is that right? What, almost. What's wrong? One of them can't have a bracket because he's never touched. The negative one, remember, that's a vertical. So you can never touch the negative one. There's our answer. But the seven does get a bracket because the original question was less than or equal so when you have the bar, you want the bracket. Less than or equal bar, you want the brackets, but never at a vertical asymptote. So there's the answer. We, we generally, we're kind of like doing the graph without doing the graph, right? Does that make sense? It's a pretty tough one there. There's like one tougher than this. Well, I mean, one type. There might be a few of them, but there's one type tougher. That's almost the toughest type right there. We good? All right. This one will be the most difficult type problem in the whole section. This is the pinnacle. This is the top of the mountain. So you can do this one. All right. So give it a try. Step one. What is step one? And how would you recognize this on the next exam? Exam number two. How would you recognize? Oh, I get that whole number line thing. How would you recognize this one? What, what does it have that no other problem has? Greater than less than. You've got the greater than less than. That's this section only. No other sections on exam two will have greater than less than. This is the only one.
So you see greater than, less than. Man, and basically, you know what I'm going to do. Exam number two, you can look at a practice exam, you'll see it. I'm going to give you one that's a fraction, like this, and I'm going to give you one that's not a fraction. One that you got back. There'll be two. No secrets with me. You, know, you can see how the practice is now. There'll be one fraction one, one non-fraction one, with a greater than, less than. One where you got to factor, one where you got to put the two into one fraction. Greater than, less than. Those are the two basic types. So this is the hardest one. So try that one. So step one, you see the greater than, less than, you go, oh, yeah, it's that whole number line thing. Hopefully you'll have some instructions on your 3 by 5 card. First step is to, is to uh, bring this guy over, right? 4 over x minus 8 minus 9 over 7x minus 7 less than 0. We good to there so far? I just subtracted that 9 over 7x minus 7 to the other side. Okay, now you have to, now it's algebra time, right? This is what you have to do all the time in calculus. You have to take those two fractions and make them into one. How do you make those two fractions become one fraction? What do you do? <clears throat> yeah, by the other denominator, huh? Exactly. You guys okay with that? You remember all that from algebra? This is where I want to be helpful to you because I know this is, this is what gets people. It's all the algebra mess. Just multiply top and bottom by the other denominator. Like that. Does that make sense? Is that good? So go ahead and multiply all that out. Now, one, one thing that really gets people, let me help, that minus in the middle, you know what I would do with him? Just put him on the 9 right away because that's really where he belongs. He's really on the 9. Remember how minus in front of a fraction goes to the top only or the bottom only, but it's easier just to put it on the top, right? I would just let that minus in the middle just travel up and get right on the non right 9 right now so that when the 9 distributes... You don't forget about him and try to patch it later and it gets all messed up. Just let it travel through right now. So distribute that minus 9 and the other side you distribute the 4. 28x minus 28 minus 9. And they'll, and they'll be common denominator. Is that good? See how that... Really, that's a um, really, really super common algebra mistake is to accidentally make this negative 72 because people forget that minus on the 9 hits the minus on the 8 the plus. Really, that's like... I think that's number one in the chart. Let's make a top 10 list. I think that might be number one. I've seen it crazy amount of times. So watch out. Everybody make note of that. We've got a minus in the middle between two fractions. Don't forget to move it to the upper right like that. It's just so easy. There's so much mess, you know. It's so easy to forget about it buried way back. We good? Then combine like terms there. Questions on this? Is this making sense? Please ask. I always feel like I'm begging you for questions. You guys got questions? You're such a quiet group. It's all making sense. That's algebra stuff. This is what I want to help you with. So this is what gets people. What was that? 19x something, I don't know, 44? 44? Plus 44? All right? Yeah, I think so. Tell me if I do something wrong. Like that, I think. Is that right? So that's all step one. Yeah? So we leave them like the denominator as two parentheses, or do we leave them? Oh, yeah, good question. Yeah, just leave it. Yeah, you want everything factored. Yeah, really good question. Leave it factored. Don't foil it out. Yeah, leave it factored. Just like, uh, remember how I wrote earlier step one? Factor or make one fraction. So I really could say factor and make one fraction. Yeah, leave it factored. Leave it parentheses. We, 
yeah, we want to leave it that way because um, because we got to find what makes the bottom zero, and that's an easier version to work with. Is there a question? Yeah. So you know how you said you subtract nine over seven x minus seven. Uh huh. So that's a, that's a, that subtraction sign. It turns into a negative only for the numerator, but not for the denominator. That that's right. Yeah, and I don't want that just to be something. Mr. Heron says, think about that, that's true, right? If you have a negative, let's just take a simple fraction, like a half, right? Isn't that negative 1 over 2 or 1 over negative 2? But not both, huh? Because if you put it on both, two negatives would actually be positive, wouldn't it? So do you, whoops, it's gone now, huh? <laughs> Come on back. There you go. All right. So, right, does that make sense? A negative on a fraction, like you said, negative 50 cents. I lost 50 cents, right? Negative half a dollar or negative 1 over 2, right? One negative on the top or bottom, positive over negative, or negative over positive, is negative, huh? But a negative on both, that would be, that would be different. So a minus sign in front of a fraction goes to the top only, or the bottom only, but I don't want to go to the bottom. I'm trying to get the common denominator. I don't want to mess with the bottom. So I just take it to the top only, and that's true, isn't it? much more important what's true than what Mr. Heron says. Hopefully I will say what's true, right? But be going for what's true, and you'll always be fine. That's true, huh? So test things, you know. Always just test them out. Say, is this right? Is this true? It's true, isn't it? Good. Other questions? So good questions. We good with that? So I'm going to go to Newton. Now, we're, we're done with step one. We need to carry that forward now. Go to a new screen and, and do step two. Step two. All right, so step two... What's step two? Oh, what, what, yeah, top and bottom equal to zero, huh? So numerator equals zero. What? I already forgot what the thing was. It was 19 plus 44. Over 7x minus 7 times x minus 8. Thank you. All right, and gray, less than zero. Okay, so there. So we're, that's the version. Once you finish step one, that's what you're going to, work with from that point forward. We're not going to go back to the original. We'll just use that. Uh, it's easier to work with from that point forward. All right, numerator equal to zero. So that's going to be 19x plus 44 equals zero. So move it over. 19x is minus 44 divided by 19. There it is. That's the weird number that makes the numerator zero. And then denominator Zero, what makes the denominator zero? Well, either one of those, so 7x minus 7 is zero, or 8, 8x minus 8 is zero. Move it over. I guess we could have factored the 7 out. It doesn't matter. So x is 1, move it over, or x is 8. So 1 and 8 make the denominator zero, and negative 44 nineteenths makes the numerator zero. Good to there. So now we're going to put those three on the number line. Which... Of those three, though, are vertical dotted asymptote lines. No. One and the eight, right? Yeah. Because that's the, that came out of the denominator. Remember, answers coming out of the denominator, things that make the denominator zero, are undefined, right? Zero underneath is undefined. Make vertical asymptotes, right? Whereas the negative 44 19, that's just going to be an x-intercept one. Because that makes the top zero. You make the top of a fraction zero, the whole thing is just zero. To make the bottom zero, it's undefined. It's vertical asymptote, right? So those are very different. So when we go to the number line, negative 44 nineteenths is there, and then negative 1 and positive 8. It's going to be like that, huh? Negative 44 nineteenths is more negative than negative 1, isn't it? Right? It's more than 1. It's like 2. Divide it in your calculator if you're not sure. 44 divided by 19 is 2-something, right? So it's negative 2, then there's negative 1, then there's positive 8. Oh, positive 1, just kidding. Oh, so it wasn't even an issue. There were, I'll, I'll quit pretending we had to think hard on it. It's negative, and the other two are positive, so clearly it's to the left. Thanks. Right, so put that on the number line. Let me go to the other screen, so... So we're in step three, number line. So it was negative 44 nineteenths. And then positive one. And positive eight. Everybody okay? Everybody getting all that down? 
So now you have to do the past. Start with the end behavior. Start with the end behavior. Remember, we're working with the, the version we had at the end of step one to answer all of our questions. So that's 19x. What is it? Plus 44 over 7x minus 7, x minus 8. Greater than 0. No, less than 0. Huh? Okay. So that's the version we're working with to answer all the questions from now on. We're, we're not going back to the original. We're just using the result at the end of step one. Okay. So what is the end behavior? What happens at the end? Remember how you figure out the end? What do you do to figure out the end? You're plugging in a thousand. You're going way over to a thousand and a million, right? So you're, all that matters when you're going way off to the end, really, really big numbers, is the most powerful term on the top, 19x, and the most powerful term in each of these parentheses. Or if you foiled it out, it'd be 7x squared on the bottom, wouldn't it? If you foiled out the, the bottom and foiled out the top, the top already is multiplied out. Multiplied out the bottom. These would be the most powerful terms, top and bottom, right? You guys with me? So is that positive or negative? That's all I care about. It's positive. I don't see anything negative at all. At least in the most powerful terms. Right? It's positive over positive. So it's positive. So it's, it's up here. It's above in the end, isn't it? I know it's going down to zero like that. How do I know it's flattening down to zero? Remember, if we reduced this, what would we get? 19 over 7x, right? Because this would cancel one of those. Remember that? And then if you plug in like 1,000 there, 19 over 7,000. How about plug in a million? 19 over 7 million. Plug in a, a billion. 19 over 7 billion. Right? If I say, I'm going to give you 19 7 billions of a cookie. That's like no cookie, basically, right? When the bottom gets really huge, that's basically zero, which means it's a horizontal asymptote coming down to zero, isn't it? But anyway, I don't care about all that. I've having said all that. We don't really need to answer that question, but they, that will be on the second exam because we answered it a couple weeks ago or a week ago, right? Horizontal asymptotes. That means the horizontal asymptote of this thing is y to zero. But it's coming from the positive on down because these are always positive values all the way. So all I care about on this question, is it above or is it below? Is it above or below? Positive or negative? So it's positive because this is positive over positive. So it's coming down positive. All right, now, what's it going to do in the middle, above or below? What's it going to do over here, above or below? What's it going to do over here, above or below? I don't know. I'm going to have to plug in some values. So we've got to plug in some values. So let's do it. Where do we plug in values? Plug in anything you want between 1 and 8, like how about 2 or 7 or 6 or 5 or 4 or 3. Any numbers between 1 and 8, plug them in and find out if the thing's positive or negative, above, positive, or below, negative. Does that make sense? Now, there's an easy way to do this, right? Do you all know that? So there's an easy way to do this um, instead of working really hard. If I just, just come over here with me, look, look over here with me. If I just put that 2 in right there and right here and right here, I just plugged in a 2, oops, in all those places, it's supposed to be a 2 there. Am I going to get positive or negative? All we care about is the sign, right? I don't care what the number is. I just want to know, is it positive or is it negative? Is it above the x-axis or is it below? Because it can't cross in between. So if it's above, somewhere in there, it's above all the, way, all the way in there, in the middle, anyway. If it's below somewhere in the middle, then it's below all the way in the middle. So how do I know? Well, the top, what is the top? If you plug in a 2, 2 times 19, some positive number. Add 44, some positive number. Positive over. What's 2 times 7? Plug in a 2 there. 2 times 7, 14 minus 7, that's positive. Times 2 minus 8, negative. Positive over positive times negative, right? Which is what? Negative. Negative. It's down here. The graph must be doing something like that. I don't know exactly. But it's, it's not touching the x-axis or there'd be another x-intercept. It's below the x-axis everywhere between 1 and 8, isn't it? 
It must be, because I just plugged in 2, and it was negative. And it can't cross the x-axis. So it's below everywhere between 1 and 8. See how I know that? Is that OK? Now, how about, how about over here? Right, because positive over positive times negative came out negative. So it's down below. So, OK, now how about between um, negative 44 ninth and 1? Plug in some value. How about 0? I always like 0, if I can use 0. You can use negative 1, negative 2. Those work, too. 0 is nice. So I'm going to plug in 0. I'm going to go back over here. See how it's real quick? You do this all the time in calculus, by the way. It's a good skill to get used to with derivatives. You end up checking positive, negative for first derivative, second derivative, whether functions increasing and decreasing in calculus. So plug in a 0, plug in a 0, plug in a 0. So on the top, 19 times 0 plus 44 is positive, right? On the bottom, 7 times 0, minus 7, negative. And 0 minus 8, negative. Positive over negative, negative. So what's that? That's positive. That means it's up here. It's going up, 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 up. It's positive. Now, I can check the minus 44 19ths. Is it a pass-through like that? Or is it a bounce? It's a pass-through. Here, here's the term right here. That's all first power. So it passes through, so this must be down below. So the vertical asymptotes, we have to do some plugging in around those, huh? Because we can't just do the pass-through bounce thing. We have to do some plugging in. They're a little bit more work. All right. So now, what, after all that work, can we answer the question, what was the question? Less than zero. Where is the thing less than zero? Here, which means x-axis from negative infinity to negative 44 19 and down here, which means from 1 to 8. Those are the two places where the graph is below the axis, where it's less than zero, huh? So our answer is negative infinity to negative 44 nineteenths, comma, 1 to 8. All parentheses, no brackets, because the original question never had a solid bar. No bar, no brackets anywhere. No B, no B, no bar, no brackets, right? And there we go, right? The graph is below the axis from negative infinity to negative 44 19th and from 1 to 8. Is that good? Questions on that? Yeah. Yeah. How did you get, how did you get the, um, that first curve again, the end behavior? Yeah. So the end behavior, it, end behavior is always just about the sign of the most powerful term top and bottom. If it's a fraction. Um, so I just looked at this thing and I thought, okay, what's the sign of the most powerful term in the top? 19x positive. If I was to foil out that bottom, what would be the most powerful term at the bottom? 7x squared. Positive. Positive or positive? Positive. Up. Does that make sense? So in behavior is just the sign of the most powerful term, top and bottom. Oh, so it won't necessarily be, it might not be like that. You're just giving an example. The arrow, it might not be like that. It's just saying that it's yeah, it's just saying it might be like that, you mean, or something? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just positive. Turns out it is actually like that. I do know that because it's got a, see, it's got a um, horizontal asymptote of zero. So I do know it's like that, but we don't have to know that. All I have to know is it's positive for this problem. All I've got to know is right, the, in the end it's trying, positive. That's all we're trying to know, right? Yeah, it's all we're trying to know. But a week ago we did have to determine horizontal asymptotes. So sh you should know that this equation has a horizontal asymptote, y equals zero. How do you know? Most powerful term in the top, most powerful term in the bottom, tug of war, top and bottom, reduces. The bottom wins the tug of war. He's got the x left over. Plug 1,000 into that, the bottom is going to win and flatten that graph down. So that's how I know it's really coming down to zero, but it is positive. It's doing it from positive down to zero. Good. Other questions on that? Does that make sense? All right, these are messy, huh? That's the worst of it right there. It doesn't get worse than that.
gonna, so the rest of these, I'm just going to do like step one. Make sure you can factor, and I'm going to go dot, 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 because the rest is the same. All right, can you do step one for me there? So 9x minus 5 greater than or equal to minus 2x squared. So you see greater than or equal to, exam two in a couple weeks. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, number line thing. First step, give a zero, right? First step, give a zero. Give a zero. And then factor. Just do the zero factor for me, and we'll stop. Because the rest is the same. So here's my point. You want to bring this guy over like that, right? And not go the other way. You always want to jump things to the side where the front term will be positive. That's easier to factor. So I'm not saying always jump to the left or always jump to the right. I don't care. You can go either way. Jump to the side where the front term is positive. That's easier to factor. All right. Now do the foil. I know a lot of people struggle with this. You've got 10 seconds. Factor that thing. Front times front to make front, last times last to make last, and make the middle work. <clears throat> so front times front, 2x times x. All right, makes 2x squared. Now last times last to be 5. Well, it could be 5 and 1 like that, but it's not. It's the other order. How do you know? Don't worry about signs. Right? I'm not worried about that negative. I'll get that later. That'll come from the sign in the middle, right? We do that at the end. But I know this is not right. Well, okay, the front times front is making front. Last times last is making last, multiplying, right? But the middle's not right. How do you, how do you get the middle? Oi. What does oi mean? Sounds Jewish. Oi. How do you get that? What is that? That means outer with outer and inner with inner. Can they make positive 9x? No way. Not a 5 and a 2. Swap them up, right? The order on the back two matters. Put the one here, the five here. Try again. Now the two inner make one X, the two outer make ten X. Yeah, they can make a nine. How do you do it? Sign in the middle, sign on the bigger. Minus one plus ten, right? So the minus one plus five times two, ten. There it is. Dot, 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 right? We good with that? Away you go from there. Two X minus one x plus 5. I urge to do the same thing on these. I'm just going to whip them quick. 4 times the cube of a number, that's 4 times x cubed. Exceed, exceed, what's exceed mean? Greater than. 12 times its squared, 12 times x squared. That's all they're saying. Now solve that. Da, da, da. Right, get a zero factor, number line, blah, blah, blah. Right? Except, one exception. Look at these words. Positives. They mean when you go to the number line, you do your little x-axis thing, don't tell me about negatives. That's a no-fly zone. They said positive only. They don't even want to know, for whatever reason, about negative answers. So they only want to know what positive answers make this true. So don't give them any negatives. All right. So remember, how, how do we do domain? Remember what we've learned about domain? We know if you have a denominator, you say denominator, you can't be zero, right? We've done that a million times, it feels like. What about when you have a root and you have inside of a root? What do we say about the inside? What, what does he got to be? Greater than or equal to zero. Positive or zero, right? Can't be negative, in other words. No, no negatives. No negatives inside of a root, only positive or zero, huh? So that's what they're doing. See, they have a, a root. So you just say, okay, inside, you have to be greater than zero, dot, dot, dot. See, it may, it may, it's just a tricky way for them to give you a greater than, less than kind of question, right? Domain, inside of a root, it's got to be greater than or equal to zero. So factor it, number line, da, 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 da. Good? Can I flash that off? Am I going too quick? All right, so that's 21. There we go. Okay. So, you know when you have a bar over something, that means average. Average cost. Bar always means average. So, they're saying, all right, average cost, 20x plus 6,000. 
over x, they're saying that's the average cost, is no more, we want the average cost to be no more, no more, no more, no more, not more. If it's not more, what is it? Less than or equal to. Not just less than. Less than or equal to. Right? If it's equal, it's not more. If it's less, it's not more. Less than or equal is not more than 80. Dot, dot, dot. First step, get that 80 over, right? First step, I want to do another step. Get that 80 over, get a 0, put it over 1, common denominator, top and bottom by x, 20x plus 6,000 minus 80x all over x. Remember, you got to make it one fraction, right? Da, 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 right? That's what you got to do. Step 1 is get a 0, make it one fraction. So I just made the common denominator, made it one fraction, combine like terms, da, 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 right? Not good on that. Pretty good. Letters carefully. Okay, bungee jumping. So it says um, 160 pound person, 41 feet, 25 pounds per foot. How much will the cord stretch? Um, oh, okay. Stiffness, no less than 25. Stiffness. What's stiffness? K is stiffness, so this is stiffness. So 2W, S plus L, that's an L there, over S squared is what? Is no less than 25. No less, no less, what does that mean, no less? If it's not less, it's greater or equal. Right? No less, not less, then it's greater or equal. So they're saying that formula is greater than or equal to 25, right? That thing is no less than 25. Okay, so what? 160-pound person, that's the weight. Um, 41 feet, that's the length. So you get 2 times 160 S plus 41 over S squared, greater than or equal to 25, dot, dot, dot. Is that good? You got one letter now, just S. S is like your X, right? S is your only letter. Treat that like your X. You got a greater than question. Get a zero. Bring that 25 over. Get a zero. Make them one fraction. Factor the top and the bottom. Away you go. Is that good on all those? Gives me how Now, you guys have done composite functions before, right? I think maybe. Uh, it's where you plug one function into the other. So they're asking me to find f of g, that's part a anyway, f of g of x. So what, is, what does that mean? Well, you guys know, here, here's the function f of x, which is uh, 2x plus 6, right? You know what it means if you put like a 3 there in the parentheses, right? You know quite well. What do I do with that 3? Plug it in where x is. Get whatever that is, 6 plus 6, 12. Okay, so think with me on that from that you know, that you know quite well, right? So think with me what we just did. The number on the right goes into the function on the left. We always plug in right to left, don't we? Everybody seeing that? A lot of flickering today. So right to left, we always plug in right to left, right? 3 goes into f. So if they give me f of g, who's going into whom? g into f. Because it's the same thing, right into left. That's what we always do. So they're really saying, don't put like a number into f, put all of g into f. That's what they're saying. Plug all of g into f. Okay. So now, what, what is f again? f is 2x plus 6. That x, though, you know what that x really is? It's like a placeholder. It's like an insert slot. That's what the f of x really is, right? I would rather they had made functions like that. I think it would be more clear. They did f parentheses equals 2 parentheses plus 6. What's the x? The x is nothing important. In fact, we call it a dummy variable. It's not a smart variable. No, it's just, it's just holding a spot. That's all that x is doing is just holding a spot. So we might as well just use parentheses. Nobody ever told me that. I remember, <laughs> seems silly to say, but I remember I was in higher math. Like, I, I thought it mattered. Like, I used to think, back when I was pre-calculus and calculus and 
a couple years after that, for a long time, I used to think maybe there was a difference between these two functions. There is no difference. Those are the same thing. It doesn't matter whether you stick x in there or you stick y in there. It's a dummy variable. It's just, it's just this. It's just holding a spot. It's just parentheses. I was doing something. I, I'd done my whole junior college thing for three years, and I was at Cal Poly. I was like in my fifth year, I think. No, I was finishing my master's degree at Cal Poly, and I was working on some proof, some high-level calculus proof thing, and they changed the letter in the middle of the proof on the thing. And I'm like, can they do that? Yeah. I remember thinking, can you do that? And they said, it doesn't matter the letter. Da, da, da. So I remember going on the side and scribbling all kinds of examples and, and, and for about a half an hour fiddling around and realizing the letter didn't matter. I remember going, man, all this time, the letter doesn't matter. Somebody should have told me that back when I was like in pre-calc or something. So here I am. I'm telling you, if you're going to go on and on and on, no, the letter doesn't matter. It's just a dummy variable. It's just holding a spot. You could change the letter up. All right. So I told you. Nobody told me. All right. So it uh, doesn't matter. So that's all a function is. It's just a blank there, basically, right? That's all that is. So f blank, put an x, put whatever you want, it equals 2 times blank plus 6, right? It's like a toaster. I always make the analogy with a toaster. Whenever you plug into that function, plugs into that slot, like putting something in the slots of a toaster. It's the insert slot. So what are we putting in? All of g, which is what? x squared. So we're plugging in x squared. So it's 2 x squared plus 6, and that's all they want for part A. Is that good? All right, let's go to part B. So same thing. So part B now says, okay, now do golf, g of f. So which way do we plug in? Right to left. So right to left. So f's going into g now. So go ahead. I bet you can do that. F's going into G. So what is G? G of blank is blank squared, right? That's what G of X is. G of blank is blank squared. So anything you insert into G, it gets inserted into B squared. So what are we putting into G? All of F, like that. Does that make sense? And then you got to foil that out, right? you got to write 2x plus 6, 2x plus 6, zip, 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 zip. So 12, not 12, I'm jumping too fast. 4x squared plus 12x plus 12x plus 36. Combine those. 4x squared plus 24x plus 36. There it is. We good? Does everybody see what happened there? So I put f into g. It's always... The right into the left. It's always how we deal with functions. Is that okay? Now, part C and part D, same thing, but F into F and G into G. I don't think we need to do both of them. Let's just do C. So part C says, okay, now give me F of F. So I'll give that one a try. Plug F into his own insert slot. Take all of F and plug it into F's insert slot, right? The holes in his toaster. So f of x is 2x plus 6. What I'm going to put in that slot is the whole 2x plus 6, right? Because remember, that x is nothing but a dummy variable. It's just holding the spot. It's a blank. Just stick in the whole 2x plus 6. We're putting all of f into f. Distribute. Do a little algebra. 4x plus 18. Got it. Good? Easy enough? So you've seen this before, haven't you? Algebra 2, a little review. Okay, so we want f of g. So we put all of g into f. Go ahead. Look, g's, g's a fraction and f's a fraction. These are the ones I want to show you. These are going to be a little messy. So plug all of g into f. So all of g into f. Good? I just did it. I just took all of G and put it in F's insert slot, which is X. Good, good, good. Is that making sense? All of G just went into F. Okay, now, 
we can't leave it this way. Because we, we cannot leave, we cannot leave what's called a complex fraction. Remember these from algebra? You cannot leave a complex fraction. That, a complex fraction means a fraction within a fraction. Complex fraction is a fraction inside of a fraction. We can't leave it. It's just, just, just ugly. It's just messy. We want to simplify it. All right, so does anybody remember? So here's where we're hitting on your algebra background again and again and again. How do you clean up a complex fraction to make it look like a normal fraction instead of fractions within fractions? Yeah, by the by that x. He's the problem, isn't he? He's what's making it be a fraction in a fraction. So just multiply everybody by him, and he'll cancel there. Right here, he'll wipe that out so it will no longer be a fraction and a fraction. It'll multiply on the other parts. There we go. Does that make sense? That's a cleaned up version of the original fraction within a fraction. What am I doing? Am I going too fast? Am I losing you? Is that making sense? See how it's just a normal fraction now? It's not fractions within fractions. See how before, before it was a mess, right? Before, it was fractions within fractions, and then I multiplied to get rid of that. Right? We good? So now it's a normal. So this is the answer they want right here. It's a cleaned up version, just a normal fraction. But if you're ready to go forward, they're going to ask another more tricky question. They're going to say, what's the domain? What's the domain of that thing? How do we do the domain? We've done that a million times. No, no big deal. Denominators can't be zero. This one has an extra wrinkle, though. So the first part's normal. Yeah, right. Denominator can't be zero. That's true. Uh, move that over. Comes a plus 7x. Divide by 7. x cannot be 4 sevenths. True. It cannot be. But that's not the only thing x can't be. If you look back, let me just say also... Before, sim, sim, before the cleanup, Let me just, I, can't, I don't have enough room to write simplification, so I'm going to write before the cleanup. So before the cleanup, remember what we had before the cleanup. Well, we had this. So what? Well, you see how he has another denominator? That guy can't be zero either. That's the extra wrinkle. X cannot be four sevens. And x cannot be 0 because the original, before the cleanup, had a denominator all by itself that can't be 0. Does everybody see that? Let me slow down there for a minute. That's a tricky and subtle point. Does everybody see what happened? You know domain. What does domain say? No denominator may be 0. No denominator may be 0. Little or big, no denominator may be 0, right? So I took the cleaned up version and I said, all right, denominator... Right there. You cannot be zero. And that was true. So X cannot be four sevens. But also, before the cleanup, this little X here all by itself was its own little denominator. And it can't be zero either. You might think, yeah, but we cleaned it up. That doesn't mean it's not really there. Just because you made it look different after the algebra simplification, it really is part of the original. So it's really there. So you really can't let X be zero. So what's the answer for the domain? X cannot be four sevenths or zero. So you've got so the trick is on a domain question for one function plugged into the other, you've got to do the domain on the cleanup and also the domain on the part before the cleanup when you first plugged in. Is that making sense? Shall we do part B? Part B will be the same and be good practice for you. So let's do part B. So part B, golf, G of F, plug it in, and most importantly, find the domain. So G of F. So is this supposed to rain like all weekend? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Man. Is this like the world record year for Fresno or something? We already have a yearly code. Yeah, yeah, we're happy to do February.
Record breaking, and it's breaking my roof, and I'm spending three thousand dollars to. Yeah, it's been a little painful for me. Three thousand dollars doesn't come out easy when you got five kids on one income, but eh, I won't tell you about my problems anymore. So yeah, the water coming through, and we got these fan, you know, these companies come out, not cheap to to dry out your roof so you don't get whatever that's called rot of some kind. Anyway, I do. I, we do need the water, so that is good. I just don't want it in my house. <laughs> all right, so golf, G of F. So F goes into G. Take all of F and zip it there into G. So we get that, F first, before the cleanup. Everybody good to there? Good so far? So I just plugged all of F into the bottom of G because that's where G's insert slot was, right? Good so far? Can't leave that. That's a complex fraction. It's fractions over fractions or fractions within fractions, right? Got to clean it up. But first, first, before cleanup, remember we have to identify we have to identify the denominator issue before the cleanup and after, right? Anybody got a denominator problem right now before I clean it up? Well, yeah, there's a denominator. That cannot be zero. No denominator can ever be zero. So X can't be seven, right? X cannot be seven. Or that'll make that little denominator zero before the cleanup. Okay, now let's clean it up. How do we clean it up? Well, what, what was I saying to do? To clean up, you multiply top and, what's parentheses there, top and bottom by the x minus 7, right? Whatever the extra denominator is, multiply top and bottom by it. So what do we get? 4x minus 7 over 5. These are drawn now equals, you can distribute it if you want or not, I don't care. Math Excel will take it either way, too, probably. That, either one of these are good, you know. This will all be on YouTube, yeah. Hey, do we have any uh, denominator here? I mean, we have a denominator here, that's a silly question, but it doesn't have an X. Boy, is it, is it maybe is it flickering like crazy to look. Um, it only has a 5, so that's not, I'll just say, not a problem. Not a problem at all. So the only denominator issue is x cannot be 7. x cannot be 7. Does that make sense? We good there? All right. Let's, we need to get on to some other stuff. I'm really awful. Well, a little, a little bit awful. All right. So f of g, we're going to put, you know, it's right into left. All of g into f. That means all that whole fraction goes into the insert slots on the top and the bottom of F. Everybody see that? See what I'm saying there? So, I'm going to get X plus 4 over X minus 7 minus 5 over x plus 4, over x minus 7, plus 8. Am I good? See what I did? I just stuck all of G into F's two insert slots, right? And now we got to clean that up. Well, actually, first... We should identify the, the uh, domain problems. Can we do that right now? What, do, what, what denominator domain issues is it going to have? X minus 7 can't be 0. X cannot be 7, right? Because of those two X minus 7 denominators. Those can't be 0. No denominator can ever be 0, right? So, that's, so identify that first off. Now do the cleanup, right? So is identify the denominator problems on the first version and then do the cleanup. So how am I going to clean this up? What am I going to do? Multiply every term by the denominator that's causing the problem. The x minus 7, huh? So every term. So x minus 7 
x minus 7, x minus 7, x minus 7. Does that make sense? Every one of those terms gets an x minus 7. And then cancel, cancel. So two of them will cancel out, the other two will multiply. x plus 4 minus 5x plus 35, x plus 4 plus 8x minus 56. We good to there so far? Then gather like terms. x minus 5x is minus 4x plus 39. The bottom, x and 8x is 9x minus, what is that, 52? So there we go for that one. It's all cleaned up now. It's a normal fraction again. It's not fractions over fractions. We good to there? What one other thing do we have to do? Do domain, yeah. So now we got to, again, do the denominator. The denominator, 9x minus 52 cannot be 0. So that means 9x cannot be 52 divided by 9. x cannot be 52 ninths, and it can't be 7. Or it's going to wreck the denominators, making them 0 if it is. Is that good? I'm making sense there. Are we good with x? I, I need to go back to some. There's some weird ones with some numbers I need to show you. you okay, that's about all the x ones I'm going to show you, I think. Oh, I know, they have a couple word problems. I need to show you those, and I'll flash back to the graphs and the numbers. All right, so let's see if we can get it. Um, all right, so, so let's try. So f, um, f of g, so g is plugging in to f. G is plugging into f. So that means I'm going to take all of g, all of g, and put it into the insert slot for f, like that. All right, go ahead and do that. See if you can clean that up. All of f, all of g, into f. So we're going to go a times and then all of, all of that, um, like that, plus b. Is that confusing? Is that making, maybe, maybe if I color coded it would be easier. Um, so, so G, G is 1 over A times X minus B, like that, right? So I put all of G into F, into F's in, insert slot, right? Okay, now, how do we carry that out? Well, this guy multiplies that guy, and they just cancel. You just got X minus B plus B, which is just X. Make sense? Just like that. All right. A couple of these word problems, and then we'll jump back to do the graphs and the tables. All right, so word problem, they're saying S of T, no, 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 they're saying, we'll get to the T, but right now they're saying S of R, just grab this, is 4 pi R squared, and that's an R there, and then they're saying R of T is 5, whoops, 5 eighths T squared, okay. And they're asking me, they're saying, hey, okay, given those two facts, I want you to find S of T. All right, what does that mean? So probably up to now in your math career, you're, you don't pay a lot of attention to the letter that's inside the parentheses, but it's going to start to become a little more important at this point. Um, so the letter inside, so this is S as a function of R, right? S depends upon R, right? Here we, here we see the letter on the right side is R. Here's R as a function of T, which means T is on the right side. Okay, now, what they want from me is S as a function of T. And they want me to write some kind of S equation that only has T as the only letter and then numbers. So how do I do that? Well, S, S is 4 pi R squared. It doesn't have a T. They, they tell me right there, S is 4 pi R squared. How do I make it have a T? Yeah, R is this. Plug that in for R. It's, it's another one of these plug one function into the other things, huh? Because r is 5 eighths t squared. So 4 pi r squared, plug into r, 5 eighths t squared, and then square it. Does that make sense? 
am I losing you? Maybe if I color code it, it'll help. So 5 eighths t squared, that is r. So you plug that in right there, and then you just square it out. So 4 pi, square that whole thing when you get it. 25 over 64 t to the fourth, right? And then 4 cancels that 16 times. So it's 25 pi over 16 t to the fourth. So there it is as a function of t as the only letter. Pi is not really a letter, right? That's a number. Is that good? Does that make sense? It's just to plug one function into the other. So we're going to have to learn how to read what they're talking about on this table. I usually put either one table or one graph question on the second exam. So let's first off read what, what they're talking about with this table. Can you tell me, guys and gals, can you tell me, like, what is f of 3? Well, let's do, let's do, let me change the game. Let's do f of 2 from the table. Just tell me f of 2. See if you're able to read this table. One. What is f of 2? Yeah, it's right there. You, you find where f and x is 2 intersect. See, it's a row and a column thing. Do you see that? You see what I'm saying? In other words, all of these are the outputs. And these, x values, x is inputs. Right? So basically, if you have an output and you, if you have an input and you want to know what the output is, right? Remember, function is like a toaster. You put in the bread... Out comes the toast, right? So um, if you put in 2, that's your input, putting it into the slot there, put into 2 into F, then you line up the 2 and the F, and you get a 1. That's the output. What if you put a 2 into G? If I can erase all my scribbling. What if you put a 2 into G? Yeah, 2 and G get out negative 2, huh? Making sense how the table works? So now, with that in mind... What is f of g of 2? Remember, how do functions work? Right to left or left to right? Right, so 2 goes into a, a g, first off. 2 goes into g, right? So what, what we're doing now, it's like if I stuck my toaster in my refrigerator, right? Putting one function inside of another. What can I do with that? Then I would take a piece of bread, and I would put it in my toaster that's, that's in my refrigerator, put it in there, push down the lever, close the door. What would happen? So the toaster would do its thing on my piece of bread for 30 seconds, a minute, or whatever, and pop, up would come toast. Then the refrigerator would start doing its thing on my piece of toast, right? The first function does its thing, makes a toast. Then the refrigerator starts chilling it. And if I open the door 10 minutes later, I'll have a piece of chilled toast. I don't know why anybody would want that. But that's the idea. Get the idea, right? We're running something through two machines. That's what we're doing. So on this question, we're putting the 2 into G. So when you put 2 into G, what are you going to get out? I already did that with negative 2. So pop, out comes negative 2, and then you put that into F. When you put negative 2 into F, what do you get out? Negative 7. There we go. See how to use that table? How to do those? I could. Let's go to the graph. with our. Okay, All right, so same kind of thing here. G of f of negative 1. The difference is now, remember, x is inputs on a graph. The x-axis is inputs. Just put it here. And the y is outputs, right? x is inputs, y is outputs. So, um, therefore, if you're looking for a point on the graph like f, right, here's the, here's the graph of f. This one's the f graph, right? If you're looking at the f graph, any dot, any x-y dot is an input-output relationship. So when they say negative 1, f of negative 1, let's just do that first off, what are, they, what are they really saying? They're saying if you input negative 1, if that's your x value, what y value comes out? One. Yeah, if you go to the graph, find x is negative 1, this dot right here, which is back 1 up 2 on the f graph, see the x, y, back 1 up 2? Or is that up 1? That's only up 1, huh? Let me fix that. Back one, up one. That's an XY relationship on the F graph. That's an input-output relationship 
on the f graph, right? So if you put negative 1 into the f function, it'll pop out with a positive 1. And then that goes into g. Always go right to left. Then you put positive 1 into g. What are you going to get? Right there. Over 1, up. Is that 6? 5? 6. Yeah, 6, you're right. Right? That means input, output on the g graph. Put in a 1, which we're putting in a 1 into g. Out will come a 6. Make sense how to track them? One function, other function. All right. Well, we are out of time. So these two sections, we made it. Just barely. These two sections are due, what was that, 4-4 four, four and 5-1. They're both due on Tuesday.